Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Yesterday, Northrop Grumman invited a bunch of people out to Utah to watch, well, the next generation of their solid rocket motors for SLS. Now, these solid rocket motors, which were originally developed for the space shuttle and then stretched for the SLS, are still the most powerful uh, rockets in the world, most powerful single propulsion system. And this particular booster had come out of the BOL program, the Booster Obsolescence and Life Extension program, where basically they were making them more powerful still. Now, as you probably know, the SLS was designed by politicians so that it could save money, finger quotes, by reusing components that were already being built for the space shuttle. The engines, the solid boosters, the external tank, those were all pretty much copied over initially, and then they had to be changed in many ways. The engines, those were great, but the problem was they were being thrown away, so they would need to restart the engine production system. The tank, well, the tank wasn't strong enough, so they basically had to completely design a new booster tank. These magnificently powerful solid rocket motors. Well, again, these were recovered on the space shuttle. They were going to be thrown away on SLS, and they only had enough boosters for a finite number of missions. They would need to restart production, and if they were going to do that, they might as well add some 21st century improvements to this design. And that's what this test was all about. So the booster had been assembled, laid up in this test stand, and when it was lit, they began a number of testing operations. One of the important things they were testing is the new thrust vector control system. So the nozzle on the, these needs to be able to move, and you can actually see it vectoring there. That is powered by a new electrical powered uh, thrust vectoring system. Unfortunately, as they got just up to 100 seconds into the test, things started to go wrong a little. Um, and then things started to go wrong a lot. So it's very clear to me that they had some sort of burn through on the nozzle, which led to hot gases being expelled into the skirt area. And eventually that led to a more catastrophic breakdown of the nozzle. And then the unrelenting flow of exhaust gases causes the nozzle and a bunch of other hardware to separate from the rocket. And the uh, engine continues to fire because it's a solid rocket motor. They don't really have any way to shut it down. It's just going to burn through its propellant. So I'm sure that after that uh, observation, finger quotes, they uh, pretty much didn't have anything more to do in their test scheme and they had to just wait and watch to see what happened and then, you know, eventually safe the booster so that they could uh, just look over the parts and figure out what went wrong. Now, those of you with memories that go back to, well, the past decade, may find the notion of a Northrop Grumman solid rocket motor, well, losing its nozzle, somewhat familiar, tickling the old memory cells. Well, this was a similar test in basically the te same test stand, almost the same booster design back in 2019. This was for their Omega rocket. This was originally pitched by Orbital ATK, which was then acquired by Northrop Grumman, and this was supposed to compete for military launches. It was uh, competing against Vulcan, Falcon 9, and uh, Blue Origin's New Glenn. Orbital ATK already had a couple of orbital rockets. They had the uh, aircraft-launched Pegasus built from parts, and then there's the Antares, which is used to deliver the Cygnus to the space station. It is also built from a bunch of different parts from all over the world. So they took a bunch of booster parts and decided to build a rocket out of them. And they submitted this to the Department of Defense, hoping that they would get a contract. They didn't. Northrop Grumman shut the program down. But there's a lot of commonality between the changes that were being made for Omega and the changes that were being made for SLS. They switched over from structural steel for the casings to composites. The thrust vectoring system switched from being hydraulic to being electrical. The power system switched from a hydrazine fueled APU over to batteries. There's new, more modern fuel formulations and binding. The nose cones could be simplified because they didn't need to have the parachute recovery system. And the skirt section at the back, the part where the rocket actually is bolted to the launch platform, well, that could be completely simplified because SLS sits pretty much exactly over the center of gravity and is bolted to the, you know, the pad. Whereas the space shuttle, it sat off center, so there was actually like a bending moment being applied over these skirt sections, and that made them, you know, more difficult to engineer. There was a lot more load that had to be handled by these. And if you remember, back when the space shuttle was originally being developed and pitched, they were planning to launch it from Vandenberg, right? They wanted to go straight into a polar orbit. 
But to make that possible, they were going to have to switch over from steel-cased boosters to new fancy composite uh, materials. And that is, of course, new in the 1980s. Now, those boosters were built and tested, but they were never flown because after the Challenger disaster, it was seen that evolving the booster design more was considered risky and they were very risk averse. But furthermore, because the Air Force finally used the Challenger disaster to get out of their commitment to shuttle, they weren't going to be launching from Vandenberg anymore. And therefore, the shuttle no longer needed the extra performance that the composite wound booster casings gave them. And for SLS, the performance improvements through mass reduction are one part of the argument for why they needed to stand up completely new booster designs, why they couldn't just, you know, build new sections of steel and build it the way they used to. There's a number, a number of other arguments, but they projected that with the improved boosters, they would be able to send maybe four extra tons into translunar injection using the Block 2 SLS as opposed to the Block 1B with the old boosters. And again... At one point, they thought they were going to be flying SLS a whole lot more, and they were facing standing up a production system which was going to be a lot more active than we saw for the space shuttle. So anyway, let's go back to the NASA test stream in glorious 480p and listen in. T plus 100 seconds. Activate after luge. Activated. Whoa. T plus 110 oh. seconds. Activate for deluge. Activated. Now we did hear a small reaction from the person running the test. It does sound muted, but I assure you this person is almost certainly a steely-eyed rocket scientist. I don't doubt that in her head she had an entire thesaurus full of expletives that would really suit the situation. But she was running things and had to be professional. Or maybe she was watching NASA's underwhelming 480p stream as opposed to NASA Spaceflight's top-tier coverage. Again, respect to the NASA spaceflight people, especially Jack, who got this good shot exposed correctly as well. And again, there's going to be a link that you can follow to watch their complete video on it. What I'm just focusing on is the moment where things go wrong. This is the first frame where we see a gas flowing around the outside. You see that it's between the nozzle and the skirt section at the back. So it's coming around from inside. There's been some sort of failure, containment failure, and the hot gases are now leaking around the edge of the nozzle. Now, as this develops, you can see that these gases are very clearly hot, so they're exhaust gases, and you can see fragments already flying out. That gas just really wants to be out of there, and it's going to push anything that's in its way. Now, in that section, that is, of course, where you've got all the thrust vector control systems. So while some of the fragments coming out of here are likely to be portions of structural carbon fiber composites, we're also likely to see chunks of that control system, your batteries, controllers, uh, actuators. I did find this image showing an early version of the redesigned system. I think this is a simplified proposal, but it gets rid of the hydrazine APU and everything, which means that it's a lot easier for it to be maintained. You don't have to fuel it with highly toxic hypergolic propellants. So now if we return to the uh, disaster as it's unfolding, you see that cloud of gas at the top just gets bigger and bigger. This is probably a very small hole, but it's getting contained by that skirt section. And you'll see that the gas flow sort of starts to run clockwise and anti-clockwise until around the structure. Eventually, it starts to get down and bounces off the bottom and gets entrained on top of the skirt. But if you look carefully, you can see that the nozzle is still attached there. So there's still enough material in there to hold the nozzle in place against this raging force of this combustion. But as I said, that hole that it's burning is only getting bigger and bigger, cutting into the structural material that holds everything together, and eventually it lets go. That small hole turns into a structural failure. The nozzle and the throat get blown out completely. You can see some larger, long sections of material which have now been liberated by this. And without the nozzle in place, those gases are expanding higher up, closer to the throat, inside that skirt. And you'll actually see that it starts to burn through the skirt section, which I believe is mostly aluminium. Now, at this point, I think the throat is still in place because while this looks pretty hot and violent, there's one more explosion that happens a few seconds later. And I think that has to have been the throat section blowing out. That's the only thing I think that makes sense. And so at this point, so you know, the throat is what constrains the flow out the back. It's the precursor to the nozzle that gives you all your performance. But without, when the throat blows out, 
then suddenly you've lost that thing that's constraining the pressure. And so the pressure inside the, like the, the length of the booster is probably dropping, which means that while this looks pretty darn furious, it's probably actually reducing the burn rate inside the booster. With the gases free to escape out the back, the, the temperature is dropping faster, the pressure is dropping faster, and the booster is producing less thrust and burning more slowly. Again, these pictures, they're all from NASA spaceflight, Jack Bayer. Awesome people, go and watch their channel, go and watch their particular take on it. I was literally in a meeting when this happened. So anyway, one could definitely argue that that is a setback for SLS, but it would only affect Artemis 9 and onwards. Using the old shuttle hardware, they had enough RS-25 engines for four flights, they have enough boosters for eight flights. The White House proposed budget wants to cancel it after three flights, Ted Cruz wants to at least extend it to five flights. So Congress is going to have to do a whole lot more congressing for this to actually matter in the greater scheme of things. This whole thing absolutely depends on existing inertia. But you know what? These boosters, they have some real historic inertia behind them. One of the things that they haven't changed is the fact that the boosters are still built in segments. That's because these boosters have to be transported from Utah, where they're manufactured, to Florida, where they're integrated and used. And that means that they have to be transported on rail through train tunnels, and the train tunnels are limited in size. You know, they're only slightly bigger than the trains that go inside them. Well, the trains in the US, they all run on standard rail gauges, which date back to like the Victorian era, right? Four feet, eight and a half inches. Why are they that wide? Well, they're that wide in America because that's how wide they are in Britain. In the 1800s, the best engineers in the world were all British. Now, the trains in Britain used this particular rail gauge because the original trains were built using the same gear that was used to build wagons that went on the roads. Everyone that built wagons used pretty much the same wheel gauge because they all had to run on the same roads. The roads that uh, all had ruts in them from the wagon wheels. But what came first, the ruts or the wheels? Well, the first major long distance roads in Britain were built by the Romans and the Roman war chariots, which were the peak of vehicular technology 2,000 years ago, they all had a wheel gauge of about 4 feet 8 inches. Why? Because they had to be that big so they could be pulled by two horses. This size was dictated by the width of two horses' asses. That is some real legacy decision-making for you. And if you think, oh, you know, this is just some old SRB technology, bear in mind that the width of the Falcon 9 is also defined by these same rules, albeit on the roads. I, I, I'm sure they could absolutely have done other things. and there, It is really somewhat tenuous, but there was actually good reason for them to build these boosters out in Utah. You see, Morton Thiokol, they developed the boosters for uh, the you know, ballistic missiles, and one of the things they found actually was the climate of Utah, kind of cool, very, very dry, was actually pretty good for casting these very large boosters consistently. You might know that a decade prior, Aerojet had tried to build the AJ-260, a 260-inch wide booster that would be the first stage of the Saturn I. They did that in Florida, and they had all sorts of problems with uh, the propellant not burning correctly. While we like to think of solid rocket motors as big, dumb boosters, they're actually a lot more complex and difficult to build than you'd imagine. The Soviet Union never really developed big solid rocket motors like the US. But it could well be that this is the end of the road for large solid rocket motors in space flight, as SpaceX has pretty much demonstrated that you can recover any liquid fueled booster and reuse it a lot more easily. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.